Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kanida Sankam, and I am the chair of the second Nugget Writing Intersection at TESOL. And I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar focusing on the academic job search in TESOL and second language writing with the title, What You Need to Know About the Academic Job Market, TESOLs and Second Language Writing Jobs. And this webinar will be facilitated by like our leadership member, and I will let the presenters introduce themselves, and then the webinar will begin. Uh, hello, my name is Ivina Tilgan Rallier, and I teach at Santa Rosa Junior College right now. And I'm very happy to be presenting with my other colleagues uh, today on an important topic. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Megan Sizek. I'm in the English for Academic Purposes program at George Washington University in DC. Hi, everyone. My name is Veronica Maliborska, and I teach at Northeastern University in Boston. And welcome. Hi, I'm Betsy Gilliland. I'm a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Next slide. So our agenda is today we'll be doing a brief overview. Our goal is to cover all of this in about 30 minutes so that when um, when you have questions, you can ask them and we'll be able to have a good discussion at the end. Um, if you have questions during the presentation part, please type your messages in the message, the chat box and the um, presenter may choose to answer it or we may hold off and answer it at the end. So our, we'll be talking about first the types of jobs available in second language writing, then how to find jobs that you could apply for, how some tips for the application process, tips for going on campus interviews and doing job talks, and tips for giving teaching demonstrations, which are often a part of a teaching related job. So next slide, please. And the next slide. So a lot of writing, second language writing related jobs focus primarily on teaching writing, where your main instructional responsibilities would be having second language learning students who are needing instruction in writing, whether it's beginning level writing or composition. Um, so, so these are some of the places where you might find a writing related job. In the United States, we have a lot of intensive English programs, some of which are connected to universities and some of which are independent companies um, that focus primarily on helping usually international students up their language proficiency in order to um, often enter a English speaking university or to get a job or for some other purpose. There's also language schools in other countries where English isn't the medium of instruction in the schools, but that specifically focus on teaching English to local students who want to improve their language skills, such as in Korea, the Hagwans or um, Japan and China also have a lot of language schools. Um, Often universities in other countries will have programs with specifically writing related instruction. Um, in the United States and in a few other countries, community colleges also hire um, writing specialists to teach in the ESL program or in the writing program. And often first year composition classes at community colleges have many second language writers sometimes with special sections just for them. Um, writing centers at different levels of education will hire tutors to work one-on-one -on -one or with small groups of students. And many English for academic purposes programs at universities also focus on teaching writing. Next slide. <coughs> Now, if you're pursuing an MA or a PhD and looking for jobs, there's also faculty positions at universities in the US and in other countries where writing may not be your sole responsibility. Um, 
in composition and writing programs and rhetoric and composition programs, you may be teaching about rhetoric and composition or about teaching rhetoric and composition as well. Um, there are administrative positions that MA and PhD holders may hold, may get in writing programs or in writing centers. Um, there's also teacher education jobs where your main responsibility may be teaching teachers about how to teach writing rather than teaching writing itself. Um, and there are university tenure line faculty positions in intensive English programs as well. Next slide. And finally, there's a lot of jobs that are second language writing related that are not solely second language writing. So often in schools, you would be teaching writing as one of many aspects of language arts or of ESL. In the United States and in a lot of other countries to teach as the instructor of record for a school would require um, licensure. There are, if you like working with kids, there are language summer camps all over the world where you may teach writing as part of the job. Um, adult education programs are also places where writing is one of many language skills, and some adult education programs also require state licensure. Um, sometimes corporations will hire language teachers and writing is a big part of some executives need language needs. So those may be interesting kinds of jobs. And finally, some policy institutions such as the Center for Applied Linguistics might also hire writing specialists. And that's all I have now. It would be great if people can think of other kinds of jobs to add them to the chat list while we go on. Okay, thank you, Nancy. I bet see, sorry. I'm so sorry, yeah. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about where to find jobs. Well, where do we find jobs? Um, this may feel like an overwhelming task, but hopefully we made it a little bit easier for you. So here are some suggestions for some popular online job portals and resources to get you started. Now, you're going to see that I have here a list for you, and it consists of uh, American Association for Applied Linguistics, Canadian Association of University Teachers, Canada University Affairs, Chronicle of Higher Education, Chronicle Vitae, Edicology, Edicology, Inside Higher Ed, Linguist List, TESOL Career Center, Times Higher Education, and UK jobs. Uh, these portals um, provide a variety of openings um, for faculty research positions, administrative positions, executive positions, and even jobs posted outside academia. Um, and most of them we have found to be useful. Other resources that you might like to check are the AAAL Graduate Student Facebook page, um, WPA and WAC email lists. Email list serves, you may be receiving this from your own institution, your university, or if you're already working somewhere, maybe through that place. Uh, fellow graduates and alumni Facebook pages, social networks uh, generally our alumni, graduates, friends, colleagues are very kind enough, <laughs> very kind to actually post some job openings for us. Um, HR websites of universities, institutions, Facebook pages, a second lang language writing interest section Facebook page, and TESOL affiliates. And finally, we would like to offer a couple of useful sources on the job search. Um, interviews. So here are one, two, three, four, five, six links for you to enjoy. And um, I would encourage you to click on the links and read these articles because it's going to be a great preparation um, for the academic job search and also will give you a lot of information to ease your anxiety about the process. Okay, here I'm handing to Megan. 
Um, hi, everybody. Welcome again. I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about the hiring process from the departmental perspective. I've been part of a number of searches here in the GW EAP program and have some insights that I've gained over these experiences. And even if you're not planning to apply for a university level job, I hope that some of this information will help demystify how um, the other side um, manages the situation, how search committees might respond to certain things and how the process goes. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay, so here's a bit of a timeline just so that you can see how everything stretches out over time for a typical university level search or higher ed level search. Um, normally positions have to be approved well in advance. Hiring memos and justification documentation can be necessary as much as a year before the process gets started. But normally by early fall, departments are pulling together an official hiring proposal, um, pulling a committee together, meeting to discuss needs and priorities, and, and starting to draft and then publish the position posting. During fall, which is where we are now, this is normally when applications start coming in and are reviewed using a certain set of criteria that's been established based on priorities um, by the search committee. And then in winter and early spring is normally when decisions are made about first round interview candidates who, who the committee might wanna talk to on the phone or by Skype. Um, in my experience, the target pool for first round interviews has been around 10. Um, and then normally interviews are scheduled and conducted in winter or early spring. And the search committee meets again to determine their short list of candidates. Um, spring is when campus visits happen for shortlisted candidates and lots of activities are involved there. Um, search committee convenes to determine who they think is the best fit for the position and normally have some kind of vote. And there are a couple of more levels of approval that usually happen before the offer is extended. Next slide. And though there, there are a lot of steps in these processes and a lot of considerations, I thought it would be helpful to highlight three main things. One is that the parameters of most positions are established well in advance, and it's a highly bureaucratic process that doesn't always have a lot of flexibility. But the department or the program usually does have a lot of latitude in figuring out what their priorities are, what their needs are, and that's used as a guide for the hiring process because the goal is getting the best fit candidate into the position um, that fits within the context of the program and its needs. Um, the search committee plays a super important role. Um, normally someone chairs the search committee. It may or may not be the director or the chair of the department. There's often a diversity advocate position and two or three other members. Um, you wanna have enough members on the search committee so that you have diverse viewpoints, but not so many that it becomes unwieldy. And the composition of these search committees may vary depending on the nature of the program. We're a very small program, so we don't even have enough full-time faculty to constitute a committee. And so we look to other departments who have some sort of stake in the work that we do um, to pull together these search committees. And the search committees work very closely to establish a timeline and criteria for evaluating applicants and moving the process forward. Um, most application materials, what's going to be collected determined well in advance and collected through an online portal that um, the search committee has a password to log on and is able to access. Next slide. So finally, I thought you might be interested to know some of the things that over the years of working on search committees that sometimes distinguish one applicant from another. Um, first is, is candidates that, applicants that know the field, um, that know the history of the field, that know what's currently going on in the field, that can position themselves um, within the field in a clear and meaningful way. Um, it's also important that applicants understand the nature of the position and what I mean by nature of the position is, is it a tenure track position that has a research expectation and service and teaching? Is it primarily a teaching position uh, with no research expectation? So understanding the title of the position and what that means in that institutional context. Um, also, of course, understanding the institutional and program context and being able to fill whatever the broad need is, like the main 
um, working mode, the types of courses being taught, the types of students that, that typically go through the program, but at the same time, trying to find a niche that's something interesting or innovative and or unique um, that might have some value for the program. Sometimes search committees know the niche or the gap that they need to have filled. Um, sometimes it's posted explicitly in the position posting. Sometimes it's not, and they just wait to see what comes up. And sometimes search committees don't even know what the gap is until someone comes along and has some interesting new angle or skill or interest, um, and then they become inspired about the ways that person might be able to innovate the program. Um, and of course, tailoring your materials and message is really important um, and something that search committees notice. And the last thing I'll say is to remember that <coughs> is, like, it's great to have a lot of expertise and experience, but search committees are also thinking about how this individual will fit within the departmental culture, the institutional culture, the types of students being taught. Um, and from the perspective of the applicant, you should also remember that you need to think about fit for yourself. Does this department fit um, the type of working situation that you envision yourself in and that you have room for growth um, and professional development? So that's all. I'm going to now turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to talk about some tips for the job application process. And we all know that the job application process is a pretty lengthy one. So it's always a great idea to start early. And here are a couple of tips that's going to make it a lot easier for you, we believe. So please check deadlines throughout the year. There may be new openings. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that academic jobs are sometimes posted uh, one year uh, before the start of the appointment. So uh, again, it's important to start on that very early. Um, another topic that's really important is recommendation letters. Please ask for recommendation letters early uh, from whoever you'd like to get your recommendation letters from. Um, sometimes we ask for recommendation letters from our professors and sometimes our supervisors, our directors. These people, as you know, are very, very busy people. So we'd like to also make their life easier by providing everything to them in an early in manner, earlier manner so that they can also help us in advance. So how can we make their lives easier? We can send them submissions information about the jobs we're applying to, our CV, specific, uh, specific skills um, to highlight uh, related to teaching or research. And we can also ask professors for their permission to include them as references. It's actually very important to ask professors for their permission. Um, if they say yes, we can list their name. Um, otherwise, maybe it's not okay to do that. Finally, we have to find out about the application process at the specific institution we're applying to because each institution has a different apl uh, application process. So we would like to know specifically what they need from us. Next comes our application um, portfolio, let's say. We generally uh, prepare application portfolios and tailor our applications. So for an L2 writing position, it's important to demonstrate deep familiarity with theories of L2 writing in our application packages. Um, and it, I also want to talk about the CV and the cover letter. Um, in our portfolio, we'd like to include a couple of things like our CV, a cover letter, a resource statement, uh, a teaching philosophy uh, statement sometimes. And we have to update our CVs and tailor our cover letters to reflect job priorities, teaching, research, publications. And we have to craft research and teaching statements um, make sure that what we can do uh, can fit the 
uh, can meet the needs of the institution we're applying to. And asking for reference letters from people who can speak to our abilities for that specific job is also very important. Uh, one of the most important things to do during a um, maybe job search process is to stay organized because it's going to also keep you sane. Uh, there is going to be so many papers and so many documents to look at. Uh, so we have found a nice way to organize our materials. So uh, you can create an Excel spreadsheet to make your job search easier. So you can. Uh, just put some categories into your spreadsheet, like the institution I'm applying to, the job title for the position, deadline, is this a research position, is this a teaching position, um, and also you can write things like CV, cover letter, um, let's say personal statement, and as you do these things, you can check things off, and once they're submitted, you can say submission completed or you can make a note that the submission will be completed after two weeks so if you have like 10 applications you're doing it's easier for you to keep track of what you have sent out and what you're still working on it really makes life easier we have tried this so highly recommend it uh, the second one is Please, please back up your information in multiple places, especially when you go to a campus interview. And don't rely only on the internet because you never know what may happen. So it's um, better to be safe than sorry. And one final warning here is that international applicants applying for jobs in other countries should be aware of visas, work permits, passport expiration dates, and other related regulations required for the job. And this information should be up to date so that they will not have last minute surprises. And what can we do to practice for an interview, a job talk? So maybe uh, one good idea is to present in front of a mirror. This way we can see ourselves and we can see our expressions. We can see our hands and gestures and decide if that's um, the way we would like to look in an interview and if it's like suitable for an interview. And next we can test if we're doing a good job by presenting our talk in front of others. And we can request our faculty members to give us a mock interview. And many institutions do this. As we know, there are uh, three types of interviews. So there's the um, phone interview, there's a Skype interview, and there's the in-person interview. And especially for um, in-person interviews, I have benefited a lot by having a mock interview by my professors and other institutions I have heard um, have different kinds of interviews for the other interview types I have mentioned before. So please use this opportunity if you can in your institution. Next, um, set a timer while you practice and minimize distractions. Finally, anticipate questions and practice handling them beforehand. Okay. Additional considerations would be read a lot of sample application materials. Um, most of the time your peers are also working on them or maybe alumni, people who have already secured jobs in different institutions can provide you with good samples of application materials. Um, pay attention to the tone language use, length, um, format of the content. Um, ask for people to proof your, proofread your materials. Um, it's important not to have any mistakes or typos. 
in these kind of documents, they're pretty important documents. Create a support group with your peers, um, your fellow graduate students, or your colleagues uh, might be kind enough to look over your materials and give you great feedback um, so that you can revisit your materials. Find out if your institution offers career support. Uh, sometimes institutions provide workshops, CV writing groups, um, writing labs provide some wonderful support to students who are um, crafting their CVs and teaching statements. So please make sure you use your resources fully. And finally, please be positive. There's a job out there for you. Sooner or later, you will find a job. It may take some time, but you will find a job. And next, I'm going to hand it over to Veronica. Thank you, Eileen. So in the last part, we will cover tips for the interview, job talk, and campus visit. Next slide, please. This is, of course, the most challenging part of the whole process. You actually get to show yourself, um, present in front of people, talk to people, and see whether you're the right fit for the institution and whether the institution is the right fit for you. You have to take the phone interview and use it as a resource. Take notes and prepare some questions based on the conversations you have during your phone interview. Um, you have to think about how you're going to communicate your points. You also have to keep in mind that you might meet a lot of different people on campus and even have phone interviews with different people. Uh, it is very common to have um, interviews in person or on the phone with the HR department, especially for private institutions and uh, institutions in foreign countries. Um, you might also need to do a teaching demonstration or uh, your job talk might be attended by not only faculty, but also students, graduate students who you will be teaching. You have to prepare a few takeaway messages from your phone interview, and you could incorporate them into your discussions and presentations to show that you have done the research and you know the institution really well. Next slide, please. Carefully study the guidelines that the institution provides you the schedule that you have, how much time you will have um, for each assignment, such as the job talk, meetings, interviews, teaching presentations, etc. If you have any questions, don't second guess it. Just make sure that you contact the search committee chair and ask them. Bring samples of the outlines or teaching materials that you have prepared. Uh, you could always you could also design um, courses or programs for the institution that you're applying to if that's applicable for the job description and say here's what i was thinking um, would benefit your institution here are some ideas so you, you can show that you have done the research and you're already thinking what you could bring to this institution and you have to be able to provide a rationale for all the choices and make sure that you have carefully thought through them. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So when you prepare specific questions, make sure you find the right time to ask them. Uh, you might not be able to ask all of them, but as long as you take notes and show that you are carefully considering all of the answers, uh, that's always a good sign. During your presentation, uh, you have to prepare the slides and think about them very carefully. You want there to be, of course, more visuals than text. They have to be clear, all of the necessary information. You have to be direct and concise. And most importantly, you have to look positive, <laughs> like I was saying, and you have to smile um, to have this positive attitude. But don't be over enthusiastic, of course. Now, when it comes to the job talk, um, one helpful recommendation that I have received and I like to give my colleagues is that you have to um, think of it as a teaching opportunity. You're sharing your experience with colleagues. 
what can you teach them? Uh, what kind of interesting projects you've had in the past that they can learn from you? Um, keep in mind that search committee members and faculty at the institution attend several of these job talks. And for your job talk to stand out, it has to bring something new to this institution. You have to tell them something new, innovative, new approaches, et cetera. Next slide, please. After all of these <laughs> fun presentations, you'll also have a few social engagements. You have to make sure that you don't let your guard down. You're still being interviewed. But at the same time, you have to be social because you are going to be a colleague. You have to show that you're a professional, but you're also a social person. You have to show awareness of your audience, avoid reacting negatively. You might disagree with some people, but it doesn't mean that you have to create a negative atmosphere or conflict. Um, acknowledge uh, accomplishments of the teams that you have worked with in the past and don't criticize colleagues or institutions. Make sure to show that if there were frustrations in your past um, work experiences, you were able to turn them into learning experiences. And for the last tips for the teaching demos, now we understand that not everybody, oh yeah, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So not every job would require you to prepare or um, have a teaching demo during the campus visit. So you have to, again, look through uh, the job description. Sometimes it's listed there, or they will let you know during the phone interview or after the phone interview uh, whether or not they require a teaching demonstration. Those may have to be done in person during the campus visit, or Sometimes they are required as a video recording as part of the application materials. So if you are applying to a lot of teaching jobs, even if they don't require it, it can be as a supplemental material submitted with your application materials, let's say links to YouTube videos of teaching uh, demonstrations. Um, whenever you record anything, you always have to make sure that it is approved, that you get an approval of the students, of your department head, et cetera so that you have the right to share the recording of your students um, with anyone else out there. Uh, you have to also ask questions about the content. Are there requirements regarding the content? Who will be attending? Students, instructors, administrators. Not everybody will be participating because some of them will be observing. Um, if you are given a specific syllabus or you have to prepare uh, the lesson plan, and if you're preparing copies, make sure you always print extra um, just in case. Print them at home. <laughs> Don't rely on hotel printers. Um, have copies uh, with you. And not only on paper, but also in electronic form. Sometimes luggages get lost, so you always have to have backup plans. Next slide, please. Well, when if you are preparing a teaching demonstration, it's also important to make it interactive, engage the audience, prepare small exercises where the audience can interact to show that you're not only lecturing, but you're also an engaging teacher educator. People may be coming and going, and you have to adjust, not get distracted by the noises or people chatting with each other when they are discussing uh, some unrelated topics, or maybe they are talking about you because they are observing you, etc. And you have to remain calm and positive no matter what happens. Sometimes the students may seem um, unengaged because they don't really want to be there or you're acting as a substitute teacher for them. Um, they don't know you, but if you bring a positive attitude, it should all go well. Um, next slide, please. So we come to the end of our presentation. We would like to give special thanks to the people who have helped us prepare the materials for it and have participated um, in the works of the intersection in the past. We would like to thank all the second language writing intersection steering committee members, Ilka Costa from Northeastern University, Sandra Zappa Holman from the University of British Columbia, Tanita Sekum from the University of Tennessee, and Michelle Kim from TESOL International. Thank you all very much. 
And I think it's time for us to take questions. Next slide, please. So just to review, I wrote down some of the questions that showed up in the chat. We had um, our guidelines, um, are the guidelines or tips that we've provided specifically for tenure track or for non-tenure track jobs or either? Um, where should people look for sample application materials? And how many positions did we apply for? And then I saw one. Another one just appeared. Um, if a tenure track assistant professor position also requires experience leading a writing program, how substantial would the experience need to be in order for us to reach the minimum qualification? Should so I, I don't know if in the first one maybe. Sure. So guidelines um, for tenure track and non tenure track. I think I can, I, having looked at a lot of jobs, even though I did get hired directly into a tenure track job, um, a lot of what we've got in the slides is um, relevant to both jobs, both kinds of jobs. Non-tenure track positions, you may find if you're um, a PhD graduate, there are a lot of visiting assistant professor positions, um, usually with the word visiting in the title, and those are often more teaching and less research than a tenure track job, but still would require um, the same application materials. So a, a letter, a cover letter, a CV, recommendations, often a teaching statement. Um, sometimes they want teaching evaluations as well from previous courses. And um, some of them are as rigorous as a tenure track job in their hiring process where you might need to, you would certainly have an interview and you might need to um, go out on a campus visit as well. It depends on what, what exactly the job is and how much funding the department has to bring um, applicants in. Yeah, and if I could just jump in quickly, Betsy, on that question. I think visiting positions sometimes have to go through fewer bureaucratic hurdles, so there's often a little bit more flexibility there, although the trouble is um, the timeline is unknown, whereas other types of positions, regular contract positions or tenure track positions are a little bit more stable in that regard, but I think visiting positions are coming up more and more these days. Um, and I would also say that the my part, which was about the, the insider view of the process, um, focused on any type of position into a university. So tenure track are not usually the lines that we get in programs like EAP. So we often have contract faculty only. Um, there are sometimes instructor level positions that are contract based where an MA is enough. Um, and then sometimes they're teaching assistant professor or assistant professor on a contract basis. And these require um, a doctorate and a little bit more substantial experience. Um, so um, I think that's how I would respond to that question. I can take the next question about where to find application materials. Um, the reality is that most of them, you just try to Google, you, you Google different websites. Sometimes you have to pay for them for these samples. Um, if you're lucky, and as Eileen was saying, you might have some colleagues or perhaps graduate students who have found a job before you they were your seniors you can ask them to share the materials with you and i was lucky enough to receive a few of those samples from three of my friends uh, in graduate school you can also ask for samples from um, other majors so most people applying for second language writing jobs they are in esl tesl or even writing in rhetoric, SLA, mixed majors, but you can also look at related um, humanities application materials and see how they uh, phrase uh, their cover letter or other materials. And it also depends on, as we were talking about before, these guidelines are for tenure track, non-tenure track, part-time, full-time positions, what kind of job you're applying to. So you can also look at different materials. Okay, this is for a research type. Uh, this is for a research job. 
this is how they write the cover letter. This is where you're teaching job. This is how they write the cover letter, etc. Yeah. Anyone else would like to? Uh, I'd like to yeah. add something to that also. Uh, so as far as I can remember, uh, Purdue University had some meetings, um, workshops, let's say, prepared by faculty members and the dean to advise students on the academic job search. So they actually prepared a huge kind of a booklet in which they gave wonderful guidance to all the students, all the graduate students, um, on what to do during the process and samples of these kind of documents. I still have a copy, um, so I'm sure many institutions are doing the same thing. So it would be very important to reach out to the departments, uh, to our professors. Uh, they might have great ideas where we could find samples, good samples of our documents. I just add like in a box that I add like that one book that might want you might want to check out. There are some like uh, uh, samples of application materials like little CVs that can be like some like group resources too in the check uh, in the box. Yeah, Tanita, it's called Academic Job Search Handbook Fourth yes. Edition. Is that what yes. you found? Yeah, that's what I, I just want to re remind the presenters that the recording won't capture the text box or the chat box, so we should actually oh, speak out. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, anything right, right. That right, goes yeah. in there. Right, it is called the Academic Job Search Handbook, the fourth edition. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you, Tanita. And I can take uh, the questions about like the the like the WPA position. Go for right, it. So, yeah, so I, I, become, like, I was the one who like I got this position after I graduated. So I think if you are interested in this position, at least you need to have like uh, some experiences like assisting like directing the writing program. A lot of institutions, they have like position for graduate students to be like assistant director of the writing program. So you should like, like try to at least have that kind of experience uh, helping directing the program and in addition you also have to be able to write your like a uh, statement what you think about your own like administration how do you see yourself directing a program so you need to get to have some kind of experience so that you can like apply for this position so that's what i my take on it mm -hmm. thanks next so question oh sorry that? One that was just posed, how many publications are needed to get tenure track faculty positions? How about book chapters? Are book chapters considered published papers? Um, I'll start with that one because I've been on search committees in two different departments at the University of Hawaii and it's very, very different. Um, so publications um, very much depend on the department that's hiring and what their priorities are. So for the Department of Second Language Studies, we were we have been looking in general for very research focused um, applicants. And so for our department, we generally want to see at least a couple of um, peer reviewed publications or book chapters in high quality edited books. Um, but for the College of Education position I was on, we really didn't care that much about publications. What we were looking for was good quality teaching. We wanted somebody who had taught teacher education courses or had um, extensive experience as a public school teacher. So it really depends on not just the university, but even the department and the job position within that department, what kind of publications are necessary, if at all. And in relation to that, I also like to add that if you're looking for a specific program and depart doing department research, as Betsy was explaining, um, you should also take a look at the courses that that program offers and the courses that you will be teaching because you will have to use your expertise in these courses. So are they all um, related to teaching practices or are they related to research practices? That would also tell you what kind of information the department is looking for. Yeah, yeah. Also related to writing labs. So if you're going to work as a writing lab administrator, um, 
maybe it's a good idea to also have some experience in the writing lab. I can take the next question that just come, came in, if that's okay. Um, there's a question about if we're unable to land a tenure track position right out of school, um, from the perspective of a search committee, will it make any difference between graduates who work on an adjunct position or work as a postdoc or a similar position? Um, I think your attitude is sort of right because the likelihood of landing a tenure track position right out of school is probably pretty slim. Um, and I would say contract positions are becoming the norm, at least um, in the institutions that I'm familiar with. So even full-time positions tend not to be tenure track in my experience. Um, I think if you're thinking of applying for positions where teaching is the main focus, then teaching work would look more appealing. Um, teaching work in a similar context, even on an adjunct basis. I know it's not an easy way to make a living. Um, if you're more interested in a research track and um, and research is, is the passion or the end goal in a tenure track position, then you would have to weight the value of working as a postdoc or maybe in more of a research setting. Um, and as Betsy said, it's also worth considering um, visiting assistant professorships, which can kind of get you some full-time experience even without the stability of a more permanent contract. I would also add that um, whatever you're doing, if you're if you're thinking as coming out of a PhD and then hoping to get a tenure track job at some point in the future, do work on publications because essentially the longer you're out of a PhD, the more you would be expected to have published, regardless of what kind of job you had. So even if your goal was to take care of family or do something that's not an official um, teaching, you know, academic related position, you would still, if your end goal is eventually to get a tenure track job, do focus on getting some of your dissertation work published because um, it would look bad to not have done anything if you were out for five years or something. But if you, whatever you were doing, if you did publish and show that you were active academically, then that shows that you're still, still a good candidate for a job. And I'd also like to add to that, that it's important to keep in touch with your former classmates and build new relationships, attend conferences where you can network because it's really hard to work on publications on your own. It's always yeah. easier to collaborate on research. And also that's where you can get new ideas for research and stay current in the trends and uh, what everybody's doing, what's the hot topic, so those are also really important, regardless of what you're doing right now. Okay, let's see. So we have Can another we have, question. Yeah. We have another question from Tamara. Is it better to work at the level you want to work at, for example, R1 or R2 in a place you don't want to stay for a while and move across the same level or work at a different type of school in the same region you want to work in. Um, basically, how does the movement between jobs typically work? So you're thinking about if you don't get your dream job in the place you want to be in um, right away, should you go for a similar kind of job, a, a teaching position or a, a research position somewhere that you wouldn't want to live with the idea that you won't stay there for a very long time, or you're thinking, would it be better to get a job doing something you don't really want to do, but in the place you want to be? I think that was your question. Um, so yes, that's correct. So anybody want to speak to that? Um, <laughs> I personally, I didn't even apply to jobs in places I didn't want to live just because I figured I could adjunct in a place I wanted to live until I got a full time position. So my choice was stay in the location, not, um, but it, I think it depends a lot also on what your preparation is and whether you think that your dream job would require you to have certain skills that you would only develop through being in that kind of position. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I think it's a personal choice that you make. So it's hard to tell anybody what to do, what not to do um, in this respect. But I mean, you might want to consider your age, how old am I? Do I want to live in the city for another five years or 10 years down the road? Um, do I have a significant other maybe who is in academia? Do they need a job also? So can we move there together or not? So there are many different kinds of considerations, but for young people, it might be very nice to just get a job, maybe in a place that they don't necessarily want to be for the time being, but that would be a wonderful preparatory stage where they can learn in their first job and then move on to a place um, that they would like to. Um, but at the same time, I would like to say that many popular cities, areas, or jobs, um, they're very competitive. Job opportunities are very competitive. So it might not be easy to get the job that, the dream job that we're looking for in the place that we want. And if I could jump in with my um, like search committee member hat on again, I think there are lots of considerations when you think about what to take and where to live and when to move and how it all goes. But if you're making an unusual jump from one position and then applying to another, it's good to be able to explain why. Like if you're applying to a lower level position than what you had before because you want to be in a city that you would prefer or if you're making some other kind of um, disciplinary jump or something to always think about that as part of your justification for applying to the position or being prepared to articulate it if you need to, or even just having a clear sense of it in your own mind, um, that sometimes search committees will ask like, well, why is she doing this? Or why is he doing this? Um, so to anticipate that that might be someone's response if you're making a change from a very different type of environment um, or switching levels of your position. Yeah, I think it may also, um, depending on your ideal position, for example, in Hawaii, we, we really like applicants who know things about Hawaii. So um, we get a lot of people that apply to jobs just because it's in Hawaii and they've never been there. And so they'd like to go to the beach or something. Um, and we generally don't appreciate that as much as we appreciate people who say, you know, I've lived in the Pacific Islands or I have an Asian connection and so I understand this, um, you know, I taught in Japan and so I have seen the Asian school systems and how those influence what people are doing. Um, so it may be beneficial if you have a place that you want to be to have spent time there because that'll help you say, yes, I understand your, your specific regional context. Um, especially if what you'd like to do is work in teacher education um, or community colleges, it's really important to know the student populations because um, those sorts of institutions are so much more grounded in their specific students. Yeah, I would really agree with that. And also, you know, sometimes you will see when you're applying for a job, they will say, we are a um, Hispanic serving institution. And then they do expect you to know the student population. And if you have worked in such a, in an institution that had a large Hispanic uh, population before, that's definitely going to be to your advantage. So we have about five more minutes in the webinar. Um, another question from Melinda, what happens if you're offered a position but you're waiting on two institutions to complete their job search? Which I think is a very common situation for professor level positions. Mm -hmm. You can always ask them whether you can get back to them within a certain period of time. 
So I was in a similar situation and it was interesting because I was applying for a teaching job in China and they um, offered me the job. But so it, it was an interesting experience. I got the job offer from the HR person and I was waiting for my top choice university to give me the answer. And I asked them, you know, how much time can I have to get back to you? And he said, I need an answer right now, <laughs> which was very unusual for me and a little bit aggressive. Uh, but again, we have to remember that it's a foreign country. They might have different policies and expectations as to um, how they give offers and how much time is spent waiting for the, the response from the person. I asked one for one day to think about it. He said, okay. And then I decided not to go with that position. And luckily I got the offer from uh, Northeastern University, which was my top choice. So it, you have to ask and you, you can't even say, can I get back to you in, within two weeks? I think two weeks would be reasonable. What do you think, Betsy? Megan. Yeah, I think two, week, two weeks is definitely reasonable. You can also ask if you're a finalist in other positions, you can contact those search chairs and actually let them know, I've been offered a job and I need to make a decision by X date. Can you please let me know if you will have completed your, your decisions by then? Something along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. Because they may, you may be their top candidate and they don't know that you're you've been offered this position. And so that could speed things up on their decision as well. Yeah, that's a yes. good point. You definitely don't want to be in a position where you accept an offer and then drop it for another offer later. I mean, I think that that's a oh, very that's disruptive bad. approach. Um, but I agree with, with both of um, the comments before about this question. Okay, we're we can take the last final question. Yeah, Renee's question, can anyone share any difference in the nature in L2 writing job positions in the U.S. and in other countries? So anybody taught writing in another country? I've only taught kind of more general English in other countries. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I have taught writing in Turkey before. Uh, in a research university, they have an English language school. Uh, this is Bilkent University. Um, and I think they treated um, pretty much, they used to treat it at least, uh, pretty much at the basic level, um, just, you know, usually writing an argumentative paper. I mean, of course, we start with the basics and then work our way up to writing an argumentative paper. Uh, but I think um, recently, some universities have updated their approaches and are doing research papers according to genre-based pedagogies. In the past, many years ago, we did not have that in Turkey. And I know that in I Japan, know. there's a, a <laughs> move to have more writing centers as well. So I think they're also thinking um, a lot more about writing as a specific academic skill that they want to build in their students. Uh, exactly. And I have to say, I mean, I don't know about many other countries maybe, but uh, I can't talk for Turkey. Uh, the good research universities or the good state universities where the medium of instruction of is English is taking writing classes very, very seriously. Uh, they have wonderful um, faculty uh, that teaches um, up-to-date courses. They are all coming to conferences in the States. These, the, these faculty members, I'm still in touch with them. Um, they're trying to learn what's going on here so that the practices are updated there. And uh, students prepare wonderful papers and projects. Uh, and writing centers, yes, uh, they are also um, I think uh, gaining a lot more priority because as we know um, writing is the most important skill pretty much uh, at university level that's why we have writing you know in our freshman courses uh, internationally and um, in America 
And I just the last thing to add is, uh, uh, I just wanted to add that you also have to look at the requirements for teaching. One of the biggest differences that I've noticed in job descriptions and from what my colleagues have told me is the number of hours you teach per week. It is very common to teach around five courses per semester abroad. True. And you can go ahead. Okay, I think we are about like 4 p.m. right now, and I would like to thank the presenter for like giving us some helpful like information, and thanks everyone for like participating. And we will make our recording available on the uh, TSA YouTube web website. And we'll also share the share a document with links to all the sites we've got on the second language writing uh, interest section, my TESOL page, um, and possibly on the YouTube site as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.